Hi, I'm Romain from Bootlin, and I'd like to talk uh, and tell you a few things about Snackboot, which is, uh, well, I guess, the latest uh, big open source project from Bootlin. It was released uh, just a few months ago. It's a vendor agnostic board recovery and reflashing tool, and we're going to see in uh, just a few moments what that uh, really is. So the goal of this talk is more so to present Snackboot from a user point of view, so I'm not going to be delving into, you know, the gritty details of how the thing actually works, because we don't really have the time for that. So let's get right into it. Uh, I don't think I'd be too off the mark if I said that most of us here spend some time deploying programs onto boards. Um, and then you probably know that this process can be more or less painful, depending on well, your hardware setup, uh, what you have currently running on your board, and also what you want to replace in your system image. Uh, my kind of personal baseline for uh, how practical some, some uh, deployment is going to be is I at least want to have a working bootloader on the board, right? This pretty basic stuff. If you have a, a fully fledged working bootloader like U-Boot or Bearbox, then you'll probably find a practical way to get your images from PC to board. If you do not have this, that's where things get interesting. Uh, so at this point, you have to work at the ROM code level. And that's when people start saying that the board is bricked, which in my opinion is a bit of an exaggeration because, well, you have the good old SD card method. You put your system images onto the SD card, the SD card goes in the board, and voila. Now, this is a good, reliable technique, but it does also have some downsides. Uh, well, to start with, some boards actually don't even have an SD port. Um, and also, you might actually want to directly flash a non-volatile, like NAND flash or something, uh, without going through all the hassle of uh, going through an, a bootloader on the SD card. It also requires uh, putting your fingers on the board more often, which, uh, as I very well know, uh, can lead to accidents. Um, so. Thankfully, there is an alternative because most ROM codes, in fact, I think uh, all of the ROM codes uh, I've personally seen up until now support some kind of USB recovery mode. So it's either like a peripheral boot or uh, it's actually called recovery mode. And uh, this is when the ROM code is actually going to listen over a USB connection. And then you can send it commands that uh, are described by some vendor product protocol. Uh, what's weird about those protocols is that, well, by nature, they're vendor-specific, right? So they're not compatible with each other. But they're also essentially doing the same thing, I guess, just with different terminology and little quirks. Uh, they usually have, well, fixed-size read and writes, like read32, write32 to sock memory, uh, what they call file transfers, which are usually just variable-sized uh, data transfers. And you also typically have a run, execute, or go command where you just tell the ROM code, uh, well, here's the address, uh, go do your thing. Uh, this is kind of where Snackboot comes in. So we do have vendor tools that already do this. Like they can leverage um, USB recovery from ROM code to get your board back up and uh, flash your images onto the board where you want them. Uh, the problem is, well, as I said, these are vendor specific. So if you work uh, like us with a lot of different types of boards, you end up uh, juggling with like three or four different vendor tools that have different CLIs, uh, different quirks once again. So Snackboot is kind of an attempt at making a vendor agnostic version of those tools that does, well, the bare minimum you need to get your images on the board, but does it with the same user workflow for a lot of different kind of boards. So the big idea behind the technical design of Snackboot is to completely separate recovery from flashing. Uh, what this means, uh, what recovery means for us, is that we can get somehow a fully-fledged bootloader into external RAM and running, and then we get back at uh, this case, uh, the second case I was talking about. Um, and then we consider that the board is recovered, and from there you can just talk to your bootloader to do your flashing. And what's interesting with this architecture is that the flashing part is, well, can be completely vendor agnostic, board agnostic. Um, so if you look at the code base right now, Snackboot, 
Well, it has two parts, Snag Recover, Snag Flash. Snag Recover is really big, Snag Flash is really small because it only has to know how, how to talk to U-Boot. So right now we have uh, six different SOC families supported. So we have AM335X, AM62X, SAMA5, SUNC, IMX, and STM32, MP1. And we'd like, of course, to have more families added as time goes on. Uh, about Snack Flash, quickly, it supports three protocols, but we're going to see that uh, in a bit more detail uh, later on. So uh, now I'd like to show you a bit how the CLI works. Snag Recover actually has a really simple CLI. It's basically two arguments for most cases. The first argument is just the SOC model, so this should be AM335.9 or something. Um, and it also needs a firmware config file, which might sound scary, but usually it's literally just two YAML keys with paths to where you generated your bootloader binaries. Um, and so then Snag Recover will just take those binaries and put them on your board. Um, ironically, the smaller part, Snack Flash, actually has a way more complicated CLI, uh, simply because it has to support like three different protocols. Uh, the first one is Fastboot, um, which basically, well, just Fastboot, you can download images, flash them, boot the board. Uh, we also have support for DFU, which works with alt settings that uh, point to specific areas of memory, and so you can uh, tell uh, Snag Flash, hey, I want to send this specific uh, system image to this alt setting, and it'll do the work uh, for you. Um, notice that for Fastboot and DFU, we actually need uh, to pass the, the address of the U-Boot uh, USB gadget device. Uh, that's because that's highly customizable, and we don't want to hard code all of them inside Snag Flash. Uh, the last one is UMS, which is a bit weird because uh, given how UMS works, this is basically just uh, like a CP or a DD. It's just that we do some extra optimization uh, with BMAP and stuff for raw images. And this is pretty much Snack Flash. Uh, so uh, for the open source part, we've had a, kind of a steady stream of contributions up until now, which we greatly appreciate, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, for example, someone added support for IMX53 uh, recently, which was really nice, really nice big contribution. And we also had some, uh, someone add uh, kind of uh, finer tuned uh, DFU controls for Snack Flash. So, we hope that this will uh, go on and maybe even uh, get uh, more intensive. So, uh, now for a roadmap, let's say. So, of course, the main goal for Snack Boot is to continue adding SOC family support, but this is more of a medium long term goal because this, this takes time and it's hard to really uh, plan ahead and to know what family we can add at what time. Um, so, for uh, more uh, short term things, we'd like to improve fast boot support. So, I actually talked uh, about this uh, with someone from Penguinetronics uh, this uh, today. And, uh, well, Basically, we don't handle sparse uh, files uh, as well as we should, but that, uh, that's going to be looked at. Uh, we also um, like it when people test Snag Recover on socks that are theoretically supported, but that we haven't tested. So we have this distinction in the code base where we know like, which socks we can theoretically <laughs> handle, but with sock recovery, there can be like, some weird tweaks like you, you think uh, you can handle a SOC and then you find out that if you don't disable that specific U-boot uh, uh, config parameter, then everything just doesn't work. So it's always good to have that distinction where we know like this SOC, we tested it on it, uh, so uh, we can put it in the tested list and it's uh, okay. And of course, we'd like to do uh, what I'm doing right now, which is to just spread the word because the goal is to have kind of a a tool that has a, a simple purpose but a very wide support range, that would be nice. So uh, it's, uh, it's always more advantageous if we get people that are familiar with uh, specific SOC families to kind of do work on it. And of course, keep on maintaining steadily, which is uh, always uh, a challenge on its own, but uh, I think we've been doing it um, pretty well up until now. And so thanks for listening. Hi, thanks. Uh, do you test on Windows? Because customers keep want to flash the systems from Windows. 
So actually, uh, from the start, we relaxed said this is for Linux. So I'm not going to say it can't work on Windows, but I don't think it can. Like it's, uh, it, it has, really hasn't been designed for that. that. That's what I can say for now. And we don't really have plans to port it to Windows right now. OK, thanks. Um, if you have multiple devices in ROM loader connected to the same host, it is useful to point to them by their USB paths. Is that supported to so, fi filter them? Yeah. So you can actually, um, so for Snack Flash, obviously, when you have, do have USB uh, addresses, you just have to pass them yourself, so you can pass custom ones. For Snack Recovery, it's a bit more subtle. We do have hard-coded USB addresses for ROM codes and like typical ones used in vendor SPLs and stuff. Uh, but you can actually pass, uh, so there's a command line argument you can pass to change the ROM code USB address. And there are, um, so in the firmware config file, you can pass uh, extra arguments to actually specify uh, USB addresses uh, for some SOC families. But you can, it's all in the documentation, uh, sometimes you can customize it, yes. Great, thank you. How do you get the information about how the protocol works? Because as far as I know, except for ST, it's usually not really documented. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't quite so get it. So how do you get the information about how the USB protocol works? Because uh, I've, except for ST, I've never seen it documented. So yeah, ST was the, ST was the hard one at the beginning. But uh, yeah, so it really depends on what we're working with to begin with. Like, uh, for some stock families like IMX, we already have an open source tool that does these kind of things with maybe more advanced features. And so we can just look at how that tool does it and just and then kind of take inspiration. But as you said, like for some other um, for some other vendors, we do not have that kind of information. So ST does have some documentation on the subject, but that was mostly reverse engineering with uh, with uh, USB packets, basically. Yes. Um, as far as I can tell, the ST stuff, this is actually just DFU, and you can use DFU util to upload the SPL into it, right? So yes. you didn't have to reverse engineer anything. Uh, that is DFU. Uh, the thing is, it's DFU, but it's vendors tweak DFU. It's not like really completely standard DFU. There are some kind of <coughs> tweaks in it, and also the different stages are, well, for example, you know, there's a stage where, where you have to load the flash layout for you boot to get later on. That's something you kind of need to guess. Uh, so yeah, it, we knew that it was DFU, but that didn't mean we had all the information we needed to like specifically reproduce what it did. Hey, so as far as I can tell, you can use DFU util just yeah. like that without any modifications. Yeah, so I haven't looked at how DFU utils work inter internally. I don't know if ha they have a special case for detecting something or not. But I know I did have to put in a few special cases in the code for the ST case. So maybe that's just specific to some way of using the, the maybe. process. Hey, but I have actually a different question. So are you re-implementing all these tools into uh, one composite tools? Or are you re-implementing all these protocols by hand? So, uh, the protocols themselves, yes, they're implemented uh, by hand, like FEL, uh, DFU, uh, we have libraries for them. And uh, everything is, like the, the big thing is Snag Recover. So this is integrated into one large code base and we architectured it into three parts and one part just has all of the, the separate ROM code protocols. And then you have uh, one part for handling firmware binaries and one part for uh, just kind of scheduling the whole thing. So we, do, we did try to have kind of coherent architecture for the whole thing, but there is some uh, serious code separation but because they're still, uh, they're still pretty different uh, boot processes. And are you in touch with vendors so that they would maybe just like help you build one such composite tool instead of everyone building their own thing with different UI? Mm. So you mean, did we ask uh, help from the vendors while making the tool? Yeah, more like, please stop making everyone your own tool. Rather, help us build one common tool with one common interface. 
Well, I mean, this is kind of the goal of the project, to have one tool that works for a lot of different vendors. And that was, I mean, maybe I'm not aware of a project that existed like that before, but the situation before is basically you had one SOC family, one tool. Yep. I was like curious if vendors are interested in like building one common tool and helping you instead of doing their own thing, every one of them. Uh, I think it's more like for some specific use cases, they might have interest for them. I don't know if like uh, putting, a, making actually a common tool is a real interest from vendors. You'd have to ask someone from, uh, from their side, but I have heard some interest uh, mostly about some specific use cases inside the company. Thanks. So it's not really a question, can if an uh, additional answer. Um, the idea was to not wait for the vendors to do it, but to um, like, Offer the idea was to not wait for the vendors to do it because they they don't do it right. Uh, so we have we have a generic bootloader or several ones. We have a generic kernel. We have a bunch of things that are generic, but it was kind of missing for that small small part. So the idea of the project was precisely to okay, let's build one, show that we can support on five, six, seven initial platforms, and then hope that vendors community will realize and and add more on top of that and progressively build up something that that is that is compelling enough that the vendors will then say. I'm giving up developing my own thing, just like they gave up developing their own bootloader, their own kernel. I mean, that's kind of the idea. Of course, at a much, much, much smaller, smaller scope, because it's a much smaller tool, but that's, that's the idea. I had one more question, too. The, for, the, for the DFU fast boot UMS features, you depend on U-boot, right, for the, to implement those. So does the documentation specify like what U-boot versions or like a U-boot config that's needed to actually implement those features? Because you're pretty tied to U-boot features, right, for that. Yeah, so um, the, um, the tool expects just um, a DFU or fastboot or whatever implementation on the other side. And so, uh, yes, we do have documentation that specifies the configuration options that you need to set in U-boot, but we mostly do that for recovery because there are some tricky options that you have to set sometimes. Uh, I don't quite remember if we went into detail for the flashing part, but uh, I think we, we probably have some documentation okay. on that, yes. Okay, thank you very much.